All right, hi everybody. My name is Mohammed. I'm the Director of Government Relations at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, panel on affirmative action. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, thank all the interns at Muslim Public Affairs Council for putting this together. It's their capstone to their uh, summer long internship. So round of applause for, for the interns. So on June 29th, the Supreme Court ruled that affirmative action, which allowed for race, con race conscious uh, college admissions violated the Equal Protections Clause of the Constitution and therefore was unlawful. In the lead up to the ruling and following the Supreme Court's decision, there was endless speculation about what college campuses would look like without race being considered in the admissions process. While those conversations will continue, we have data that shows the impact um, of this ruling where the nine states have actually banned this practice. Starting with California, in 1996, the state passed Proposition uh, 20, or 209, which banned uh, race conscious admissions. That year, black students at UCLA comprised 7% of the student body. Just two years later, that number dropped by half. In Michigan, home to one of the largest American Muslim populations and the first city in the United States with an all Muslim city government, uh, banned race conscious admissions in 2006. That year, black enrollment at the University of Michigan was at 7%. By 2021, it had fallen to 4%. This precipitous uh, drop isn't limited to undergrad. Uh, the American Medical Association shared that uh, states have, that have banned uh, race, uh, race conscious decisions have seen the number of minority medical students drop by roughly 37%. Some of the proponents have said ru the ruling will bring back equity in the admissions process or the drop in my, uh, numbers can be explained by other factors. However, the numbers don't lie, and this ruling will bring about multi-generational harm to some of the most vulnerable and long marginalized communities in our country. The issue in the ruling is near and dear to our hearts at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. As American Muslims, we know that education is a requirement for a vibrant democracy, and we know the importance uh, that Prophet Muhammad and his family placed on education. Imam Ali has said, education is the light of the heart and the light of the eye, and destination of the pious. And most famously, the prophet is known to have said, seek knowledge even if it takes you to China. And with that, I would like to turn the program over to Kais, who serves as the Congressional Leadership Program Development Fellow to introduce the panelists and kick off the discussion. Thank you for being here today. Hi everyone, thank you all for being here. Welcome to this MPAC panel discussion titled Setting the Record Straight, deconstructing affirmative action. As by now, everyone is aware, on June 29th, the Supreme Court released a decision determining higher education admissions based on race is unconstitutional. Chief Justice John Roberts, writing for the court's majority, struck down the use of race in Harvard College and the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill's admission program. Roberts wrote, eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it. He, just, he continued by outlining how the two programs, quote, unavoidably employ race in a negative manner involving racial stereotyping, and lack meaningful endpoints. In response, MPAC released a statement strongly disagreeing with the decision and stating that, quote, all Americans, including each of the diverse racial and ethnic groups that make up the American Muslim community, will only benefit when historically disadvantaged populations are elevated to a position of equality. The recent Supreme Court decision declaring affirmative action unconstitutional in the context of admissions for institutes of higher education has created a lot of recent controversy. Affirmative action was originally created in the 1960s to redress disparities and provide opportunities for underrepresented groups in the realm of education by considering race and admissions. However, students for fair admissions contended that the use of race as a factor in admissions undermines the principles of the 14th Amendment. In many cases, students who live in affluent neighborhoods and attend higher ranked schools have access to more resources to help them succeed and increase their chances of attending college. Unfortunately, not everyone has the same opportunities and resources, particularly people of color who may score lower on traditional metrics used for college admissions. The consequences for eliminating affirmative actions are, are already evident to, today. For instance, as was already said, Michigan bans its use in 2006, um, and after which the black population at the school decreased by 44%, despite the growing number of black students in the state. Fundamentally, this issue is about how we contend with issues of race and issues of class in our society. I know there are many students in the room today, uh, many of us in college right now, uh, planning on attending other institutes of higher education. Um, so this panel is both pertinent 
and uh, very timely uh, with this recent Supreme Court decision. I'll move on now to introducing our panelists. Uh, joining us for day, today on the discussion on this decision and its implications on American law and in education are Dr. Amara DeCure, Dr. Dwayne Casey Wright, and Michael Kippens. Thank you all for being here. Um, so just before I, before I introduce them properly, uh, just to kind of lay out how this is going to go, um, we'll have a short discussion. I'll ask questions to all the panelists. Um, and then we'll, I know a lot of people have questions, so I'll make sure there's plenty of time at the end for q and I want to make sure that most, not everyone that has a question gets a chance to engage with the panelists. So first, uh, we'll go through some short introductions. Dr. Amara DeCure is a senior professional lecturer of education at American University and an executive board member at the Center for Islam in the Contemporary World at Shenandoah University. Her scholarship spans the areas of anti-racist pedagogy, Muslim student experiences, prophetic pedagogy, faith erasure, equity, anti-racism, and social justice along with education leadership, teacher education, and faculty development. Dr. DeCure has published articles and chapters in peer-reviewed journals and books, and her public scholarship appears in various news and media outlets. A highly regarded educator and facilitator, Dr. DeCure teaches education studies and social justice education leadership and teaches an anti-racist research methods course she co-designed. She brings over 20 years of teaching leadership experiences from public and private K-12 schools to inform, her, to inform her current work in higher education. So if you will join me in first giving a round of applause. Dr. DeCure, thank you for joining us. Dr. Wright is an assistant professor of education and human development and director of DI initiatives at George Washington University and GSE HD director of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives at George Washington University. His research and social activism seeks to advance educational opportunity and equity for all students, uh, particularly those historically oppressed and marginalized in American society. Dr. Wright's research is located within three broad theoretical frameworks, critical race theory, sociocultural theory, and critical pedagogy. His, research, his legal research interest focuses primarily on education law, um, First Amendment jurisprudence, and American equal protection theory, very relevant today. Um, Dr. Wright joined GW's Graduate School of Education and Human Development after serving as a visiting assistant professor at Savannah Law School in Georgia, where he taught constitutional law. So if you don't, if you don't get right. Uh, last but not least, Michael Kippens is a Lauren Sampson Fellow at Lawyers for Civil Rights, or LCR. Michael Kippens joined LCR in 2023. In this role, Michael represents uh, clients in a variety of civil rights cases, including police accountability, education, employment, and climate justice. Prior to joining LCR, uh, Mr. Kippens worked at Safe Arts Shaw, where he represented clients in commercial and business litigation matters. He was also actively involved in pro bono work, including uh, some LCR matters as well. And Mr. Kippens also previously served as a judicial clerk to the Honorable Margot Botsford of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and to the Honorable R. Malcolm Graham of the Massachusetts Commonwealth Appeals Court. Thank you for joining us as well. So to kick us off, I'll just ask a question for all three panelists and maybe uh, we can start with Mr. Kippens and then uh, Dr. DeCure and then Dr. Wright. Um, why don't we just start laying a groundwork for everyone um, in the room. Can you tell us, how do you understand affirmative action? It's a term that's thrown around a lot and how has it been applied in your specific field? Sure, sure. So first of all, thank you for having me. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. And so with respect to affirmative action, I, you're right. There are a lot of different definitions there. It's, it's a very broadly used term and it can apply in a lot of different ways. With respect to some of the work that I do, affirmative action in particular in higher education means combating traditional efforts that kept people of color out of schools. And that's the sort of broad sense that I consider it to mean. It most definitely has specific programs and specific criteria that are used. And in this context, in the admissions process, by schools, including Harvard and UNC, but also numerous other schools across the country. And I think you've spoken to a little bit about what, what happens when affirmative action is taken out of context or taken out of the process and how schools, universities, states, and federally, that's going to look when 
this, this Supreme Court decision was issued about a month ago now, and particularly with the new set, the new cycle of admissions that will be coming very soon, we hope to see some changes that are going to be very important and aimed at including and increasing diversity, even without some of these traditional affirmative action approaches. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dupree. Just ask if my colleague could go first. Oh, sure. Allow me to um, bring in a K 12 perspective. So, my brothers and sisters, good evening. <laughs> brothers and sisters, good evening. Thank you for inviting me into your space. I am truly honored to be part of this conversation, sort of with you today. Um, they tell me that this was almost 100% set up by interns which is remarkable. And I just want, before I start to talk, to allow you to give another round of applause, not just to sit on this event, but for the entire work you all have done on the Hill and off the Hill for MPAC this summer. You know, before, you know, we start to get into the nitty gritty, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for the work that you have done. Why don't you clap it up for yourself? Thank you. Thank you for letting me I know how hard it is to do these. <laughs> You understand? So I know today will be a tremendous success because of your hard work. Uh, my name is Dwayne Quasi Wright Barrington III. I have a very long name that covers a very long tradition. I am the son of immigrants. And I'm an immigrant myself from the country called Trinidad and Tobago, which is a Caribbean country about 10 or so miles off the coast of Venezuela. You might say, you know, Dwayne, what are you doing this week? Yes, I am Muslim. And are there Muslims in the Caribbean? Yes, there's the Uma everywhere. As my father would constantly remind me when I was growing up. Uh, after spending some time in Trinidad, I spent some time in Venezuela, spent some time in Brazil. I immigrated uh, through Hialeah, Miami. Some will say aggressively. I would just say, you know, you know, it wasn't necessarily legal, <laughs> but I'm a citizen now, so I know how it is to be undocumented. I settled in New York City, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, before going to an HBCU in Southern Virginia, North Fork State, spending six years at Pennsylvania State University, where I got a law degree and I got a PhD. Why do I tell you that story in defining what affirmative action is? Well, first, let me tell you what affirmative action is not. It's not reverse discrimination. In order for something to be reverse discrimination, it needs to be two things, prejudice plus power. And, you know, affirmative action never had that sort of, you know, sort of bill. It is not discrimination against white folks. Who in this room knows that the number one beneficiary of affirmative action, when it was still in existence, was white women? So it's kind of hard for me to understand the argument that affirmative action is discrimination against white folks. Here's what affirmative action is. In 1619, there was a group of people that happened to be Black that were taken from their country and brought here not necessarily illegally, but definitely against their will. Many of those were Muslim and had to give up their religion upon the passage that we now call the transatlantic slave trade. And that was in 1619. From 1619 all the way to about 1865, four or five generations of African people that were brought here and transformed into what we now call African-Americans were denied access to public education on the K through 12 level and definitely higher education for the most part. After this thing called the Civil War, the bloodiest war in American history, it wasn't all, you know, Googleys. We still had discrimination. In fact, there was a compromise made just 15 years after the end of the Civil War that said, hey, you know that slavery thing that lasted for three, four generations? We don't have to deal with it anymore. Sounds familiar? Yes, it does. And then we have 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, you understand, separate but equal. Now we're in to the 20th century, and it goes from 1896 to 1954, legalized, state-approved segregation that said that if you're Black, you can't go to George Washington, you can't go to American for no other reason because you're Black. What affirmative action sought to do in its best form was to reverse, was to take into consideration 
the five and six generations of unequal treatment that Black people had within this country. And it was a limited, very sort of compromising sort of policy to try to fix that down there. How does it show up in my work? As a director of DEI, I have a responsibility for all students, not just my Black students, my Latino students, my Asian students, but for all students to form the most diverse class possible. Why? Because research, research that my colleagues would do, research that I have done says that a diverse environment helps learning. That if you only have one perspective in the classroom, you're not really gonna get the best ideas. A diverse environment helps business, it helps revenue, it helps policy. So we try to get the most diverse class we can possible. However, because of that history that I just described, from 1619 to 1865 to 1896 to 1954 to 1964 Civil Rights Act. 1964, my grandmother was born in 1939. There were many states that could have denied my grandmother a job or the right to go to school well into her 40s. We're not talking about ancient history, folks. We're talking about something that just happened. And what affirmative action was meant to do, it was meant to say, yes, we did wrong, and there was something that we needed to correct. And it allowed people like myself to assemble a class that quite frankly, didn't just help them, but it helped white folks as well. Because a lot of white people used affirmative action to say, hey, I had a very diverse class, hire me. And after 1978, it was meant to benefit all students. So I say after 78, in this case called Baki, we never really had affirmative action. We had race conscious admission. And what happened a few weeks ago, even that was too far for white supremacy. And we need to call it out. We need to use the words that actually mean what we're talking about. What happened two weeks ago was a victory for white supremacy. So we're here to talk about what happened. We're here to talk about the limited correction, and we're here to talk about a runaway Supreme Court that ended that too early. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So I will, um, I will take your lead in sharing the personal story to connect with the reflections. Um, I went to high school in Northern California in the 1980s. I was a great student. I did very well in my classes, and I was excited in 12th grade to apply for colleges. And when the acceptances started coming through in the winter of 12th grade, the conversation that I remember today, and my family can bear witness that my memory is poor, but I know exactly the conversation I had in my English classroom, and I know exactly the name of the young man that I had this conversation with. And we found out the names of the schools that I was accepted to, he said, oh, it was affirmative action. So the conversation that I want to bring into this is what does affirmative action mean and how is it impacting kindergarten through 12th grade education? Because of the Supreme Court decision that we need to address today is a decision about higher education. It has meaningful implications for how students experience kindergarten through 12th grade. One, because it continues to promote a false narrative that this was a program to benefit people who were unqualified or less qualified to access higher education. And that false narrative has been in our schools for far too long. Our school counselors, our school teachers, our school leaders are insufficiently prepared to have disrupted that narrative over these past decades. So when we think about how students in kindergarten through 12th grade are impacted, let me focus on students who are in high school and secondary education and their guidance counselors, the ones that are primarily in charge of supporting, through, uh, supporting them through their college going processes. Affirmative action has impacted kindergarten through 12th grade where there is the permanence of this false narrative that race was the soul or the key factor in college admissions. It never has been the sole or the key factor in college admissions. 
as my colleague is saying, we had race conscious, but it was never race soul, all right? And that false narrative has impacts on students, particularly students of color, as they make college going decisions. It also permeated a false narrative that uh, for students for whom affirmative action was designed, that those students themselves were less qualified to access higher education. That does something on a young person. It does something on a young person. It influences how that guidance counselor is or is not supporting that young person with their college going decisions. All of this because of the impact that affirmative action has created these false narratives that persist in K-12. Now that affirmative action has been, uh, has ended through this Supreme Court decision, there's now what I feel is going to be a fear that students are going to assume a burden that they are going to have to describe in the college going process, how racism has impacted their lives, that they're going to need to assume the re-traumatization of recalling what they feel may be the most dramatic, the most obscene, the most eye-catching story that will be able to name that racism still matters and still impacts them, describes that for an audience that they will never see and use that as a tool to access the next chapter in their academic career. It's a fear that I have that I don't fear, that I don't feel is misguided and I am worried of how our students are going to move through this next phase of college going process. But I'm also worried about the college counselors that we have in our schools. We have an insufficient number, poorly trained, and not um, inclined to guide students towards anti-racist goals and priorities. And so I'm unclear how this new impact of this new reality is going to translate for young people as they make decisions on what parts of themselves they represent in the college going process. Um, I'm also concerned that the impact of the ending of affirmative action is going to reproduce a false narrative that race has no meaning in our society anymore. And that has a very um, significant potential to do harm, not just in the college going process, but in a student's entire school experience, kindergarten through 12th grade we're already at a very um, vulnerable time in our education experience here in America, where there are many policy actions that are dismantling our ability as educators to address race and racism in a classroom, to be able to address students' identities and how their identities may be racialized and or marginalized in our society. And I'm concerned that this decision is going to have additional impacts that the message that race no longer matters is going to receive validation and that that message is going to impact how teachers and counselors create space for these conversations in our kindergarten through 12th grade schools. Affirmative action is needed. It is needed because of the state of kindergarten through 12th grade schools today in America. Our schools are segregated. Despite the history that my colleague can name about uh, the decision of Brown versus Board of Education, our schools in our, uh, in our nation today remain segregated. Our housing patterns in our country remain segregated. And because of this, we have disproportionate allocation of resources in our public schools, both physical resources, think textbooks, Chromebooks, um, uh, classroom resources that you may see physically with the eye, but I also want you to think about human resources, the capacity of expert teachers, the capacity of expert counselors, the capacity of expert curriculum to be able to create impactful learning experiences for students in the classroom. We have disparities in our schools today, and we can trace many of those disparities to students' racial identities. So race does matter in how students access education in kindergarten through 12th grade, and therefore it is mattering as students move through that K through 12 pipeline into higher education. Um, I'll pause here and join in the conversation as you move through the questions. Sure. Um... 
why don't we actually pick up on one of those last points? You said the message is that race no longer matters in our society. One of the arguments that the opponents of affirmative action uh, would make just not um, just not just in this case, but just more broadly in our society would be, I don't want to make a straw man here, that these terrible things happen, um, but that shouldn't affect our admissions programs today. That if you have two applicants and no matter what historical precedent, if you're giving them a plus and the other one is not getting that plus, that that might be inherently wrong. And those opponents might go on to say something like, admissions should always should only be based on quote unquote merit. And usually they would define that as an SAT score or a GPA. Um, I'm interested to know, how do, you, how do you all react to that argument? Um, if you believe, if you agree with it, then explain why. If you don't, where where is that argument missing piece of understanding of how race and class work in our society? Um, you want to do our colleague on there? Sure. Um, Would you like me to start? That's perfect. Yeah. Sure, sure. So I'll start with the idea that you mentioned about merit and how it's been sort of traditionally described with sense of test scores, whether SAT or otherwise, AP course availability, GPA, class rank. You know, I think what gets missed is that those metrics are not unbiased, that there is an entirely, you know, there's basically this whole idea that gets put out there to simplify what merit should mean because they're looking for a particular result. And what we would know is that if those were the only criteria that you use, you would end up with a particular, a particular lack of diversity in a lot of senses because there are biases in, in a lot of those testing environments in terms of what the preparation looks like in schools, what the socioeconomic conditions are surrounding the students in certain areas. And there are just so many underlying biases that go into those metrics so that if you only looked at those, you would end up in a situation where you would lack, you would severely lack diversity, even though very many students on other ways of measuring merit would be qualified. And a lot of those students would be students of color. Thank you. So how many people in here, anybody who just taken a gander, wants to study either medicine or public health? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. Be proud. Oh, proud. Yes. I, need to know, I need to know I'm going to be calling yes. a doctor in a couple of years. Yes. You know, yeah. you know, we don't have universal health care in this country. Yes. Anyway, yes. In public health and in medicine, we have this thing where we try to not let the cure be more tacit than the disease. We just came out of four or three years of COVID-19 where we're trying to get people to take a vaccine. And the reason that you know, we weren't very successful in that is because we allowed a public you know, relations you know, nightmare happen where the cure became more toxic than the disease. In America, we had a disease. It's called racism. It's really called anti-Black racism. And the core of anti-Black racism is white supremacy. We are much more reticent against race conscious efforts to cure racism than we are with racism. Because of that, we confuse two things. We confuse empirical colorblindness with aspirational colorblindness. Mm -hmm. Aspirational colorblindness is a great thing. I'm five foot four. I really want to dunk. I have never done it. I still, at 35 years old, have the aspiration to dunk. And I'm going to continue to have that. Empirically, I can't dunk. Empirical colorblindness means that race doesn't matter. Aspirational colorblindness means that race shouldn't matter. What the other side is doing and what this decision including the words of the Chief Justice confused, is aspirational blindness with color blindness. They truly think that by saying race doesn't matter in the law, it means race doesn't matter in real life. But thank God for the sister, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, who called them out on it and said, no, 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 that's not how it actually goes. Race neutrality in reality is just a way 
to freeze in the status quo. And I think we all understand that the status quo is one of white supremacy in this country. That doesn't necessarily make us a racist country at all, stop the story. But I'll tell you what, to bring out a current event, what happens when you confuse aspirational colorblindness with empirical colorblindness? You start saying foolishness like slaves benefited from slavery. Oh. So you understand what I'm talking about, about race neutrality. You start saying foolishness like the freedmen, which came out of the Civil War and slavery was based on race, was a race neutral status. It is not. So what race neutrality actually is, is a way to have racism without race. And you have to call it out where it is. You have to be smarter than that and not fall for the okie doke the confusion of aspirational colorblindness with empirical. Excellent. The, o- the only thing that I'll add is you're asking where do we stand with the, these metrics of, of merit? And I agree with my colleague on Zoom that these metrics are inherently biased. I'll also name, uh, we have disproportionate access to these metrics. So if we talk about AP classes as a metric for higher ed access, well, then we need to do a map across the country what schools do and do not have access to AP courses. There's disproportionate access to AP courses in black and brown communities. If we talk about access to the SAT or the ACT exams, we have disproportionate access to taking those exams, getting the transportation to those exams, and people who benefit from private tutors that give them a leg up on uh, uh, success on those exams. Then if you talk about uh, GPA, class rank, we also see disproportionate access to those internal school metrics because students in their own schools are facing disproportionate discipline, push out, lack of educational opportunities within their own school space. So then you can open up uh, merit and say, okay, well, then we can give uh, credence to certain athletic programs, musical skills, artistic skills. Again, you look at what students do have access to the orchestra, to playing musical instruments, to, uh, what do you say, uh, rowing crew, to be able to play lacrosse, all these unique sports that get additional points and credits on the higher ed um, admissions opportunities. Many of these are located in well-resourced communities, which has been white communities in this country. So even what we deem as objective metrics are not accessible to black and brown communities. Um, one additional reason why this is the argument can't stand. Mm-hmm. And then um, Mr. Kempton, a, a, a lot of us in this room are, are not lawyers, um, probably haven't read the, the long docket like decision from the Supreme Court in full. Maybe we've seen some quotes um, from cable news and the like. Why don't you, it seems like we've established that perhaps getting rid of a firm action was a wrong decision. What was their reasoning? What was the reasoning of the Supreme Court? Um, what factored into their analysis there? Sure, and I'm happy to do that. First, I'll start with, if you have read the entire decision, I applaud you, because if you are not lawyers, it would be a very tough read. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll start with a quote from the majority decision from Chief Justice Roberts, and then I'll sort of break down what I think that means. And so I'll start here. So it says respondents, which would be Harvard and UNC in this case, fail to operate their race-based admissions programs in a manner that is, quote unquote, sufficiently measurable to permit judicial review under the rubric of, rubric of strict scrutiny. First, the interests that respondents view as compelling cannot be subjected to meaningful judicial review. Those interests include training future leaders, acquiring new knowledge based on diverse outlooks, promoting a robust marketplace of ideas, and preparing engaged and productive citizens. While these are commendable goals, they are not sufficiently coherent for purposes of strict scrutiny. It is unclear how courts are supposed to measure any of these goals, or if they could, to know when they have been reached so that racial preferences can end. And that's the end of the quote from the decision. So what that means is this, when a case or a a policy is race-based and race-based on its face, meaning that it has a racial component that you can readily identify at the outset, 
it is reviewed by the court under what's called strict scrutiny. That means that in order to have the program continue, the proponent of the program must show that whatever their goal is, is a, is a compelling interest and that the methods that they use to achieve those goals are narrowly tailored to achieving or accomplishing those goals. So the goals here, for example, the court talks about training future leaders, acquiring new knowledge based on diverse outlooks and the like. What that means for Harvard and UNC, once they put forward that those are their goals, then they have to prove that the way that they accomplish those goals is basically one of the only ways to actually accomplish those goals. So here, the admissions process would include a race conscious decision making process. And in this particular instance for Harvard and UNC, it involved what's called plus factors in the, in the admissions process, meaning that it could possibly boost your chances of getting in if you are a person of color and identified as such. What the court has said now is that those goals can't be measured, or rather that the accomplishment or the percentage accomplishment of those goals can't be properly measured, and thus the court can't accept them as goals that Harvard and UNC could achieve with the expectation that at some point race-based admissions at race-based admissions would be able to end. And in theory, because of some sort of reckoning, frankly, about the idea that there would be a, a fair and equitable access to education for, for everyone. So that's really what the court was saying in terms of why they made their decision. There are many different interpretations of why they decided it this way, why they said that there is a very now limited way of considering race in the admissions process. And that way is, as was said earlier, to express for the student and the application to express how race might have been involved or how it might affect their individual experience such that they have built some sort of character trait that a school would be, would be interested in having at that institution. So for example, if a student wanted to say, I am the leader of the, uh, the Black student group at my high school, and based on that experience, I believe I've, I've obtained leadership qualities. I've obtained a, an ability to have people express different viewpoints, to organize, to, to do things like that. So the idea in the application from the university's perspective might be, okay, well, we want this particular student, not because they're Black, not on its face anyway, but more so because they have this experience with race that has provided or offered them leadership qualities or a strong moral sense that we want to have at our school. So essentially what the court has done by ruling this way is said that it's really putting the onus, the burden on the applicant, at the applicant, as opposed to the school to really ensure that there are recruitment efforts that are made, that there are efforts made to ensure that you're recruiting from all different areas, from different socioeconomic status, because frankly, there will be, and especially at a school at Harvard that only has about 2,000 applicants per 2,000 admissions per class, that's not a lot of people compared to the number of applicants that apply each year. So what could end up happening is there could be people with great leadership qualities, people of color with great leadership qualities, all of whom were, are still more advantaged, whether socioeconomically or otherwise, than other students that are similarly qualified, but just that have a different or a less advantaged access point, meaning either Harvard didn't go out and find them, or the students self-selected, which is a massive problem, self-selected not to apply because they felt they couldn't get in. Thank you. And then I'll, I'll make this my, my last question to the panel because I want to make sure we have enough time for Q&A. To our two educators on the panel, I'm just wondering if you can articulate a little bit about what perhaps has been lost 
um, through this decision, um, what taking away maybe some of that diversity, how that affects you when you're when you're when you're educating students or when you're involved um, in in your case, Dr. Wright, in, in DEI initiatives. What exactly has been was been has been taken away? What's been lost in this decision? If I had a week, I couldn't tell you the amount of things that have been lost. A lot has been lost, and it didn't start to be lost two weeks ago. I think it's been a cascading, you know, trend. Quite frankly, ever since the election of our previous president, but they told me not to get political, so I won't go there. Um, so let me just do one. Let me add on to what Michael just said, and then I'll get back to that question, right? Because I think in sort of going to what was lost, we often forget something that he said that needs to be emphasized. The court has now transferred the responsibility from the people that have the power, Harvard University, $29 billion endowment, to the people that don't have the power, right? The students, right? So what is lost is a little sense of responsibility, right? And throughout this nation, really for the past five years, people have just been losing responsibility, saying whatever is on their mind, Twitter or X, whatever he wants to call it now, you know, have just been gassed with racism. And I think we need to just recognize that because that's an important point. The second point we need to recognize is, why is Harvard so important? Part of the problem of affirmative action are employers that would rather hire the last person in the class at Harvard than the first person in the class at Howard or America. Or even GW, you know, they like to think they're prestigious over here. You understand? So there needs to be, going back to that word responsibility, placed back on the employers, not an affirmative action is lost. Of course, good lawyers like Michael are still going to do the suing, but employers need to say we're going to have diverse hiring as well. Now, what has been lost in the classroom? Three things, very quickly. First, perspective. You understand that. I have been teaching now for about six or seven years, and I can't tell you, whenever we have a monot you know, just a monolithic classroom, whether that be gender, whether that be religion, whether that be socioeconomic status, you really don't have the discussions that are necessary to impact the world, because the world is not monolithic. Mm -hmm. Teaching requires diversity. And because of what we did in this country, race is a proxy for diversity. Now, there's also diversity within race. The brother Clarence Thomas and myself are both black. You put us in a law school classroom, we're going to be saying completely different things, right? So I'm not here to be a race essentialist. But what was lost was perspective. Number two, what was lost, at least in the higher ed and the graduate classroom, are role models. When I went to school, I am the first in my entire family to go to college, law school, grad school, you know, on and on and on. There was no one that looked like me. I went to law school. I don't know if Michael had the same experience. I was three, three black male in a class of 250. I went to graduate school. I was the only black male. I'm now in the MBA program in George Washington University in DC, just got an award for diversity. I've taken 10 classes. I've been the only black male in all but two, right? So we're talking about the fact that a lot of people feel isolated. And you know, I ain't telling no one in this room something they don't know. That takes a burden. You can't be the best student that you can be when you look around and no one even looks like you. You understand? Or I am an immigration lawyer. I get calls home from New York City for people that are criminal, for people that are trying to buy real estate, because there are no other lawyers in the community, right? And that burden is placed on just a few of us, right? We need to recognize that. The last thing that's sort of lost, and I hope it could be something that will be gained, quite frankly, is the fact that no one policy will ever be a panacea for people of color in this country. Affirmative action, while it's a major loss, right, is a combination of things that are happening in this country that we need to think about happening together, including immigration policy, you know, including what has been discussed, which is the fact that your zip code determines your education in this country. That literally, we have in this city alone. You know, you can go from right here, which is a very good neighborhood, you understand, take a train, transfer to the Green Line, 25 minutes, go to Southeast, be in a completely different neighborhood. New York City, Billionaire's Row 
is just five train stops away from the South Bronx, which is some of the poorest zip codes in the entire nation. And I tell you, the schools are completely different. Why are we more segregated racially today than in the time of Brown? So let's not just think about affirmative action in a vacuum. What is happening in this country is a retrenchment of white supremacy. And I think we are, we lost the battle against that. Doesn't necessarily mean we lost the war. And I'll stop there. Yeah, so picking up on that, we're, what we have lost is we are taking our eyes away off of where we need to be making change. So we are using this Supreme Court case to talk about the graded hierarchies that we have in elite colleges and universities. Harvard is considered an elite college university. As you're saying, their acceptance rate is probably something below 4%, mm -hmm. right? What we're failing to pay attention to is that we have graded hierarchies in kindergarten through 12th grade that we allow to continue and we're not making any uh, decisions and actions to stop that. If you have a younger brother or sister at home, three, four, five years old, or a little cousin, a son or a daughter at home, you're probably having conversations about, I wanna send this child to the best preschool. What does that mean? Why in this country do we have something called the best preschool? We allow graded hierarchies for our youngest students. We allow some students to go to best preschools and other students don't, and we accept that. In your hometown, you all are, many of you, I'm talking to college students, recent college grads, in your hometown, raise your hand if in your hometown there was a good high school where people went to college. Just raise your hand. So we shouldn't allow that. There should be no conversation in our hometowns that that school over there is the good school where people are going to college and your parents are doing everything possible to keep you out of that other school where we don't know what happens to those kids after 12th grade. We're allowing that graded hierarchy to persist in kindergarten through 12th grade. So we're losing attention from the work that really needs to be done. This decision for the Supreme Court really is impacting just a small slice of the elite colleges and universities in this country. Many of our state institutions have long ago abandoned affirmative action, race conscious policies, and they have wide access for their residents. Their acceptance rate is much more north of 4%. We're talking 20, 30, 40% of applicants who meet their expectations are invited to apply and get accepted. What we're losing in this conversation is more resources, time, and attention to support our state colleges and universities, which have been doing the work of educating black and brown communities for decades. We're losing attention on community colleges. One of our nation's best kept secrets, an amazing opportunity for students to study near home, complete their gen eds, not go into debt. Yes, some of them are still paying and we can deal with why we need community colleges that are free and available to all. But these are the low cost opportunities for higher ed and many of them have clear pathways to moving into a four year college or university once you've completed the first two years at that school. So we're losing attention to what we need to be doing to making lasting change in this country by just focusing on elite college and universities admissions processes. We need to address those, but our nation cannot take our eyes away from the real work, which needs to happen in K-12 and happen in other colleges and universities outside of Harvard and uh, some of their elite peers. Thank you. Um, okay, so we can move to um, Q and A, but first of all, why don't we give another round of applause for everybody? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you have a question, just raise your hand and um, please make it clear who you're addressing your question. Um, so, Assalamu alaikum. Um, so my name is Soha. I am a current student at UC Berkeley. Um, I have a question. It's my album. So I just wanted to ask quickly on the topic of recruitment. Um, I at UC Berkeley, a very large conversation when it comes to recruitment is also retention. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just curious if any of you have any specific thoughts on 
how this affirmative action decision will not only affect recruitment, but also retention. I know that mentorship was mentioned a little bit. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, yeah. so I will pass around some business cards because there's no way we're going to get all the questions answered. If you like something I said, email me. If you hated something I said, email me. And we can have a conversation about it. Recruitment. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with the lawyer's answer and I'll try to make it a little bit more practical. This decision was limited to the application of the Equal Protection Clause in Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act towards admissions, towards admissions. Now, the Chief Justice, unlike some of the concurrences, really painstaking limited it towards admissions. Uh, if you study higher education, the I in the IEO framework, input, not necessarily environment and output, you understand? So recruitment, particularly race neutral recruitment, particularly at Berkeley, where you have been dealing with a ban on affirmative action since 1996, right? So your recruitment had to be so-called race neutral anyway, should not be impacted. That does not mean that the same right-wing zealots, I'll say it, that sued to get this decision won't sue places like recruitment. We've seen in certain red states like Missouri, they've said no to uh, race conscious financial aid. The decision doesn't necessarily call for that, but there will be places, governments and schools, quite frankly, that will use the decision as an excuse. However, I think recruitment should not be something that's stopped, but increased because of the decision. Because now that you can't use affirmative action in the decision-making process, what you're gonna to try to do is to expand your pool. The more diverse and the bigger your pool, the more you hope you can fish from that pool and get a diverse class without affirmative action. So recruitment should not be impacted, particularly in California, which is not a red state, but for those that do come from red states, it may be impacted, but that's not because of the decision. That will be either a political decision, or quite frankly, some schools are gonna say this, we don't wanna get sued, we don't have the money to get sued, let's just end it all. Hi, my name is Isra. I'm a student at the University of Maryland. Um, I guess this is a question for anyone, but I was wondering, especially as an Asian student and as someone who came from a quote, higher, um, I guess, resourced high school, my high school is like almost half Asian, half white, um, what your reaction is to a lot of those students of color who kind of perpetuate um, the attack of affirmative action and how you would kind of respond to those students because they feel like they are being victimized by affirmative action, even if obviously that's not the intent. Mm -hmm. That's a deep question. I, I, I'm not gonna do it justice. So please, my fellow panelists, help me out. <laughs> I, I'll give you some time to think. Um, some of the deepest racism have always, always been internalized racism. Mm -hmm. Let me just start off with that. That we have been trained in this country. We have been trained as immigrants to this country, really everyone that's not indigenous is an immigrant, to hate ourselves and to love what they have, however we want the day to be. So, you know, some of it has to do with the after effects and the impact of internalized racism. The other thing is, and I, I said I was going to, you know, as a good professor, I give some book suggestions. And one of the book suggestions I'm going to suggest is uh, The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. And what that book suggests in the argument that's made is that we have been trained to think of equity and all our resources as a zero sum game. That if they win, we lose. In reality, what's happening is there's a few, not even racial, there's a few that's sitting at the table while we're fighting for the crumbs. And I refuse to play the oppression Olympics with my Asian brothers and sisters because I understand that neither one of us are at the table. You understand we're fighting for the crumbs. Now, I am not here to disrespect anyone's lived experience. So if you come to me and you feel you've been victimized, let's talk about it. But the reality and the research and the facts shows that Asian Americans were no worse off, you understand, based on affirmative action. I am not defending Harvard's plan, right? The initial Harvard plan was to keep Jewish students out of Harvard. And I'm sure, based on what was happening, that I don't, you know, Harvard didn't necessarily treat every Asian applicant fairly. That does not mean that Asian applicants were kept out because of affirmative action. And I hate, I hate, I hate, and I know how you know strong that word is, but I hate to see my students used. 
and I think many students will use. Yeah, and I, I just see this as another iteration of white supremacy culture that is trying to pit people of color as enemies towards one another. I think it's another re, um, uh, reproduction of the model minority myth that Asian American students experience less oppression than other minorities, and therefore they need to um, be exempt from any type of racial uh, uh, support programs, uh, uh, safe spaces, identity supports, culturally responsive um, experiences there. And I think um, I think that when we reproduce this narrative and we, we validate it, we allow it to um, can continue to move forward. I don't spend a great deal of time trying to convince students of the merits of embodying anti-racist stances and actions. I find myself doing more work with allyship building and helping students see a path toward social justice and a path that is wide and embracing for all who are looking to bring equity into our school spaces. right here. All right. Um, first, I just want to thank you all for coming again. Um, my name is Layla. I'm a student at Northwestern University. And this question is kind of directed toward Mr. Kibbins. Um, I know you're working on a lawsuit against Harvard University for the use of using legacy admissions. And just in my personal experience, there are so many kids who go to my university that they just kind of assume they get in because their parents went there, their grandparents went there, and they just kind of felt they were entitled to it. And so my question is, Split into kind of two parts. One, what is the argument that legacy admissions is fair, um, and that you know it allow like what is the like what is the argument that it's fair, and kind of what are you and um, other lawyers' argument as to why it's not fair? I don't know if that makes sense. Sure, sure. Thank you for the question, and given the timing of the both the Supreme Court decision and the federal civil rights complaint that we filed with the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. I think to answer your first question, I don't think legacy admissions are fair. I think that's the sort of entire point of why we're filing the complaint. Some of the data says that, you know, particularly for applicants with family ties to wealthy donors, they're around seven more times likely to get in than someone without that preference. And with respect to legacies, people who have applicants or applicants who have connections where their parents or other siblings have gone to that university or rather Harvard in particular are nearly six times more likely to get in. And 70% nearly of the students who are let in admitted through those preferences are white. And so to start legacy and donor related admissions are inherently unfair. The data says that the data was produced during the affirmative, the, the affirmative action case that recently the Supreme Court ruled on and Harvard produced a lot of its application and admissions materials. And so the data says what it says, right? If you're asking what would Harvard say is the reason why legacy admissions are, are fair, I'm not sure they would necessarily use the word fair. I'm not gonna speak on their behalf, but from other materials that I've read, their assertion for why it's fair is because it keeps a sense of community. It keeps a sense of relationships with alumni. It also helps with alumni funding. Now, what I'll say about that is there are also studies to show that at many of the top universities, having no legacy or donor related preferences in their admissions process has not affected their ability to fundraise. I think it was said earlier in the program Harvard is one of the universities that has the largest endowments on the planet, not just even in the US. And to say that their fundraising is going to become an issue by eliminating donor and legacy preferences to me is, is frankly disingenuous because in a common sense thought way, who's not gonna go to Harvard just because they know that down the line, their children won't automatically or you know have a much higher chance of getting it that just wouldn't make a lot of sense as a way of thinking it's just not logical 
And so that's the first part of the question. I, I can't remember what the second part of the question is, but if you could repeat it, I'm happy to answer it. Yeah, I think the second part of the question is, you know, what is the other side's argument into believing that, you know, legacy admissions is fair, but affirmative action is not fair? Oh, I see, as a, as a comparison point. So I think really the idea is it's just about who benefits. You can call anything fair if you really want just to say that you are trying to accomplish a particular goal. It doesn't mean it's actually fair. And I think what we've seen both from the data and a lot of the explanations, including what's in our complaint to the Department of Education, is that it's clear that it's unfair, right? It's very drastic in terms of what the differences are. And there's expert analysis that says very specifically, if donor and legacy preferences were removed from the admissions process, then admissions for applicants of color would go up and admissions for white applicants would go down. And there really is no other way to justify that piece and to say that anything about that piece of the admissions process is fair if that's what the result is. Um, are there any more questions? Hello, my name is Miriam. Um, the question is from the same video that we have in the here in the um, question. So we talked about the accommodation in terms of testing um, and how that manifest, manifests in K through 12. And as a student of color, like that was something that happened throughout my life. Like I went to one of the best high schools in the country, even. And, when I was there, um, counselors told me to hide behind my name to write about like the most tragic story of my life, to make up lies um, about my life so that I could get into schools because I'm half Syrian, half Venezuelan. So you can imagine like, how far I can go. Um, <laughs> so yeah, they were telling me to like create such lies so that I can get into higher schools. Um, and I know that I'm at a disadvantage to other students because I don't have the socioeconomic status, for example, to get high scores on an SAT or an LSAT um, when I apply to law school as well. Um, and so part of it is kind of a difficult place to be in because while I don't want to sell my identity to get into a school, um, I still do think that it gives me a higher chance of getting into a school, particularly law school. I think I saw that more um, because I was a great student. Like the GPA was great. I had the extracurriculars. My LSAT was on the lower end though. And I think that if I didn't have that diversity aspect um, where I could bring a perspective to law school that I would not have been admitted. So how do universities combat that like narrative where you have to traumatize yourself to get in and how do we as students also fight that narrative where we like I do believe that I have a diverse perspective but I don't want that to be necessarily the reason I did it. First of all I'm really sorry I'm really sorry that you had that type of advice that I find just repulsive for a young person you're 17 18 years old when you're applying for college and that just doesn't make any sense to me I think you've answered your own question. So I'll repeat some of what you share, right? You said it's important to you that you contribute to the diversity of the next in institution that you're seeking admission to for law school. And so I want to remind you of that, that your goal in writing your next personal narrative is to emphasize the diverse viewpoints that you are bringing to your next institution. And you do not need to highlight any racialized trauma that you have experienced in order to demonstrate that you bring multiple viewpoints into your next classroom. And I think how do we as students, how do you all as students push back on that is by you all rising up and naming this is what I will reveal about myself in this college going process. And then I won't be revealing what I don't want to reveal to a room full of strangers and be confident in that. When you write your personal narrative, you write it where you're the main character, you are acting in a stance of agency and empowerment and leadership, bringing all the diverse perspectives that you have gained in this process through your identities, your multiple cultures, multiple lived experiences, places, what have you. 
And then at the same time, when you all assume the responsibilities of leading the colleges and the institutions, then you all push back on these admissions departments that they do not expect to see trauma and have plus points for trauma-informed essays as a demonstration or validation that this person has experienced racism. We need adults in the admissions office that recognize that students from diverse backgrounds have experienced multiple forms and embodiments of marginalization and racism, and that those don't need to be revealed and detailed in their essays. Yeah. Yeah. The, the best essay I've ever read was from a young Palestinian student who talked about the fact that, you know, his family was pushed out in what's called the Nakba. Um, but he said during the first intifada, he couldn't go back over, but he was a football star. And then during the second intifada, he could, and, and he kept saying, I know that's the pain, but I'm going to refuse to write about it in a way of resistance. And that's why I am going to graduate school to get that next step of resistance. Mm -hmm. And I didn't read anything else. I said, yes, full scholarship. I was talking about it with my family for two weeks. You know, instead, I told the dean, need to get some extra money. You know, what do I need to do? So don't feel like you need to commodify yourself and buy into the neoliberal culture that says your value is limited to your diverse perspective to be consumed by someone else. Let's all commit to leave this room and to not buy into that mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in law school, you understand, while the trauma porn may be what unsophisticated people are asking for, what the ABA, which is your accredited body, is showing how you bring diverse perspectives, how that perspective will impact the field of the law, mm -hmm. right? So I will talk about your perspective, and I will talk about how there aren't lawyers like you, right? And that doesn't need any type of exposure or re-traumatization. So own your narrative, shop your narrative, and I guess what? The schools that really want the other stuff aren't going to want you here anyway, and you're not going to enjoy that experience. Mm -hmm. The schools that appreciate what you do right is where you want to be. Yeah. I think that's a better place than any to, to end. So why don't we give our panelists another final one? And if we can give another round of applause to all the impact staff and the interns for the <laughs> I know Katya had some final words. Um, Assalamualaikum, everyone. My name is Katya Said, and I'm a policy research fellow for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Thank you all for attending the panel discussion today on affirmative action. Hopefully, we can all take away the importance of affirmative action and why diversity is so crucial for higher, higher education. We look forward to continuing to engage, listen, and learn from one another as we strive for a college admission process that ensures marginalized students are not ostracized from the benefits of higher education. Thank you to our panelists, Dr. Amara DeCure, Dr. Dwayne Kwasi Wright, and Michael Kippens uh, for helping guide our discussion today and providing their valuable insights. And Empath thanks you all, and we wish you a good night. Thank you.